Our pastor has been away this past week, uh, along with the team of our our workers with uh, disaster relief, and they've been in Washington, uh, not D.C., Washington, North Carolina, N.C. And um, Donna, I heard that they're coming back tomorrow. I was a maybe. Okay. No, no, that's okay. Uh, I just got word that they they were so anyway. So they've been working all day, feeding about 7,000 meals a day. And so that's where our pastor is. He did come back Thursday, I understand, to have a scan done for his surgery. So the date of that is not, if it's definite, we haven't heard it yet. So that's where he is today. Um, He'll be gone sometime in the future weeks. But actually, in in light of that, it worked out well because he had already lined up Carrie to to preach for us today. And our guest is Carrie Sims. Uh, She is the director of the Baptist Center. What comes after that? We just call it the center? Okay, I'll call it the center, okay. Uh, So she's going to come and speak with us. Thank you, Carrie. It's good to have you with us. Yes. No, it's great. It's always great to be here at Fairview. This is a church that has just loved us so well over the years. Um, Gannon and I have been pioneering this new way of reaching young adults in um, a college setting at, right across the street from the University of Mary Washington, generously funded by um, the Baptist Association here and Fairview itself. So um, it's always a joy to be able to share with you. You guys are so close to the center, so it's almost like it's your world is my world. Um, we're all in the same neighborhood. Um, And I can just, as a welcome from the center, um, this year is just off to an incredible start. Um, We, our our main event, our main outreach event is every Tuesday. We have a dinner. We feed um, up to 75 or 80 people every week. And what's really cool is Anna is with me here today. Anna leads our kitchen team. This is the first semester that we have a fully functioning team of people that week to week prepare the meal and set up and cook. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. It's going so well. So I'm thankful for, for Anna and so many others that have stepped up to make this, this and all of our other events function so well. Um, I think it's really cool that you guys have the picture of our logo on the front. I was actually thinking of referencing this because we're talking about John 15 today. Um, so we talk a lot about this image of the vine and the branches and what it means to abide uh, in the Lord because it's one thing to believe in Jesus, but it, bec- it can become an intellectual inter- exercise. And so at the center, we talk a lot about what it means to walk in intimacy with Jesus and to walk in obedience. And that word obedience is interesting because the root of it really means to listen. So uh, we can't really obey unless we first know what God is asking us to do. So that's what we're creating is a culture of young adults that are wanting to discern God's voice so that their whole world would be oriented toward listening so that they can obey. So in some ways, it's, we're hoping that they're not focused on mission projects. They see their whole life as a mission opportunity. It becomes a lifestyle. It's a way of living. So this morning, I'm going to read from John 15, verses 4 through 11. Should be familiar. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like the branch and withers And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, in my words, abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. So as I was studying 
um, this passage, it was really hard for me to even get past the first word, abide, because it seems there's so much there. The word is used 10 times in, in the passage that I read. So I became curious um, and started thinking, when do we even use the word abide anymore? It used to be used a lot. And I thought, well, abide by the rules. Um, I had a hard time thinking of other ways that we use this word abide. But abiding in Jesus is not at all about abiding in rules. It's about a way of being. And in verse 4, when Jesus says, abide in me as I in you, he's commanding us to obey. And it's a gentle command. Um, And I won't bore you with all of the um, explanations of the Greek tense here, but it suffice it to say that Jesus is not making a suggestion. He's giving us an assignment. It's even a responsibility that he has given so that we can help bring about the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Abide in me and I in you portrays a beautiful image, but yet there's a real weight to this word abide. You can almost hear the sacrifice and tension here. This word often appears in scripture when there's a need to continue on or persevere in difficult circumstances. The word means to remain, to endure. So these are actions that require patience and a heart that is steadfast, which is why it was a choice word for John to use to describe the intimacy that we share with the Father and the Son. Choosing to abide in Jesus requires a sacrifice. It means putting to death something of our flesh. And not just the sinful desires, just all of our flesh, all of the control, all of our good efforts. It requires us, like Jesus, to be long-suffering. And in this text, Jesus is the vine, and we can't think about this image of the vine without visiting the cross. Because true abiding happens when we acknowledge that this new life comes from a death, a death to self. Just even thinking about the pruning process. So to abide is always a choice. But Jesus never asks us to do anything he hasn't already done. So you can see throughout scripture, he models for us what it is to abide in the Father's love. So we're just being invited into that. It's also about identity. This verse describes a relationship of presence and mutuality. Jesus is talking to the community of believers and explicitly attaching his identity to ours. Because our identity is rooted in God from the very beginning, intricately, intricately designed to be linked with God, created in his likeness, marked by his image. And the cross makes a way for all of us to stay connected to the Father. And so many of us that grew up in church, that seems like a really familiar thing, to be children of God, to be to have a Father in heaven. But I can tell you that that's not normal for most people in America anymore. Um, people who did not grow up in church, certainly the young people that we work with, um, they don't have any context for a heavenly Father. So when they hear that good news, that they are indeed children of God, it is a real revelation. It could, and it should be for all of us. But so often we misrepresent God because we forget who we are. Because our identity as Christians often becomes about what we do, not who we are. And, what, and how, we, how we live, how we just be. But the kingdom work that we do, if it's rooted in our identity as daughters and sons, it has this transforming power that is like no other. We've talked about how abiding is a choice. And I also want to suggest that abiding is a place. I love words, so I do lots of word studies. So abode comes from the same root as abide. And when I think of abode, I think of a, um, it conjures up just an image of of a home that is simple, but warm, comfortable, inviting. And so I can almost imagine Jesus welcoming me into his dwelling place and hearing him say, welcome to my humble abode. Because the place Jesus lives is marked by humility. And abiding is a bit like finding ourselves at home with Jesus. 
And while this is a very good place to be, it's not a place we always choose to go willingly. Because remember, the vine is a place that often requires us to revisit the cross. Sometimes the entry point into this level of abiding requires a death to our ambitions, to our striving, to our insecurities, our excuses. But when we lay down our lives, we find true life. And it's a whole new way of living, this idea that the fruit of our labor is born not by our own efforts or deeds, but born from deep within the vine, from that place of union with God, where we experience the reality of Galatians 2.20 that says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is very much the spirit in which John is writing to us, as John 15 comes directly after what is known as Jesus' final discourse in chapter 14, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, reminding them of the promise that even when he leaves, he, they, he will, his presence will still be with them. In John 14, 2, Jesus invites his disciples to dwell with him, saying, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And while it's tempting to think about these heavenly rooms as places that we will access after we die, in, in, in what we call eternal life, but really eternal life begins when we accept the Lord and begin to follow him and walk with him and commit our lives to becoming more and more like him. Our eternal life is now. It begins now. And you even see this in, in the language used because mansions, this word room and mansions, is also the same root of the word for abide. So this dwelling place or room points us to the relational dimension of our life with God here and now. So when Jesus talks about remaining in his love, he is talking specifically about the mutual, reciprocal nature of this love. And to enter this love is literally to come home. And we all know there's no place like home. But just accepting this mysterious act of love requires humility and acknowledgement of our dependence on God. And so this is the work we are called to as disciples. I think most of the time we think it's about the work out there, serving others, telling them about Jesus, and that's part of it. Those are all good things, important things. But I want to suggest that if our acts and deeds are not rooted in this participation with God's love, and more, yeah, that they lack this resurrection power, that they lacked, they lack the ability to bring real transformation. Later on in verse 14, Jesus says to his disciples, if a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. It's kind of a deep thought, how Jesus would come and make his dwelling within us, how he would choose to abide with us, to make his abode with us. So I just want to lead us in a time of prayer, thinking about that, thinking about how that knowledge, how that, um, how that truth might change things for us this week as we go about our days, as we think about, as we however we spend our days, whether we're in school or at work or with family. How does it change? How will it change for us understanding what it means to receive the one who comes to us and to makes his, who makes his home with us and dwells with us? So would you pray with me? Lord, we want to create more space for you in our lives. So I pray that even now as we just imagine what it is for you to dwell with us, we actually can imagine your presence in us living and breathing. 
What are the things that need to be cleared away? What are the things we need to let go of or surrender to you? To make more room for your abiding presence within us. Thank you that you are such a good father who delights in his children, who co-labors with us to bring about your kingdom work here on earth. I pray, Lord, that you would, that you would blow fresh wind into our lives, into our bodies, into our homes. And that being at home with you and the radical truth that you are also at home with us would inform everything we do this week. Thank you that you have the power to transform and renew our minds. And I pray you would do this. In Jesus' name, amen.